and tonight we have Lee Burden, the Assistant Superintendent for the Department of Financial Services, Marty Smith, the Chief Operating Officer, and Alex Wigington, the Director and Office of Budget Services. So, Ms. Burden, I believe you're going to start us off. Oh, Mr. Smith is going to start us off. I'll start us off. Good evening, oh, everyone. I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, we we <laughs> have a table I've, got, I've full. got more. I only have three on my agenda, but we've got We have some special guests tonight. There. We have Dr. Helen Nixon with us, who is the Assistant Superintendent for Human Resources. We have Michael Drager, who's the director for uh, HR Business Services. Uh, we also have Matthew Norton, who is the senior uh, budget analyst in our budget office. And we have Sean McDonald, who is our director for talent acquisition and management. Yes, TAM. We just call it TAM. So we're very excited uh, to bring you the budget this evening. I know that we had uh, Dr. Brabrand uh, presented a uh, wonderful budget to you. And uh, we know that there were questions about a little more detail. And so we're going to bring that detail this evening. We also have all of our members of our leadership team here tonight. Uh, uh, just a little shout out to our colleagues there along the side who are available to answer any questions that you might have about the budget this evening. We have a lot of ground to cover. We do want to honor the time that we that you do have, uh, and so uh, Ms. Burden is going to go through in her uh, her uh, style of a very quick presentation, so that gives us more time for questions and discussion. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Ms. Burden, and we'll go from there. And just let me just interrupt one second. In the spirit of what we were talking about, Dean um, and, and Mr. Smith, you started down that road. We do have a hard stop tonight at 8, so if school board members do not get all of their questions in or done at that time, uh, by, by that time, we will have to work offline and directly with staff to do that. But we will be ending this session at 8. Well, we have a second budget session, yes. That's, uh, uh, what date is it? 31st. 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 That's the one, though, at Luther Jackson. It's a little bit different structure. Okay, go. Um, good evening. Um, this is the first budget work session for the fiscal 20 budget, and it's my first budget um, with FCPS. Uh, I'm very proud of this budget and what it may accomplish for the employees and students of FCPS, but I have to give special thanks to the Director of Budget Services, Alice Wigington, and her team. I am so appreciative of their talent and hard work, and you know, I've, I've not worked with, with people that are as, as talented as the people in DFS here at Fairfax County Public Schools. Um, they and the other directors have made all the difference. And they have been extremely supportive in my first year here at FCPS. Um, as Marty said, I'm going to go pretty fast. Um, this is the agenda for today. Uh, I'm just going to go over in much more detail the increases to the fiscal 20 budget over the fiscal 19 budget. Uh, this chart should look familiar to you. Uh, it was included in the fiscal 20 budget presentation by Dr. Brabrand. Um, it's about goal one, student success, and it totals 16.1 uh, million. This next shot slide shows the detailed expenditures that make up the first line item, instructional resources of 12 million um, for instructional programs that, on the previous slide. Uh, the largest increase is 4.3 million, and of course that's for FCPS on at the high schools. Um, 0.6 million for online campuses to address enrollment growth uh, with additional hourly teacher funds. Uh, a million for the division-wide learning management system. Um, we're updating or replacing the uh, internal communications that RFPs out. The academy programs, um, uh, half a million dollars, about 100,000 for AVID, 700,000 for FESEP, a million dollars as a placeholder for increases in retiree substitute pay. Um, 0.6 million for high school language arts adoption. Um, and just so you know, we have 11.4 million budgeted for, for this, but it's expected that's gonna cost about 12 million. So this, again, the 600,000 is just the increase. Um, about 800,000 for an assessment database. Um, 400,000 for restoration of assessment coach contract extensions at the high school. And 1.3 million in contractual services which I'm going to blow that out in the next page so you can see it. Um, this is basically the contractual services piece of student success. It breaks down the 1.3 million. The first thing is the uh, VPI plus increase of about $650,000 due to salary increases brought about by the teacher salary enhancement. 
um, we agreed in the grant contract that we would cover the increased cost of this program in the future. But note that the governor did include additional funds for VPI Plus in his budget, so this expenditure increase um, will hopefully be covered by the increase in state revenue uh, if that, that piece of the governor's budget um, passes. Um, we also have the rest of the things in student success are IT increases. Um, increases in annual software licenses, mostly, and that's for uh, college and career, e-card assessment, Google monitoring, EduPoint, or the IEP uh, system, the SIS, online student enrollment. Um, those are all annual software increases that fall under student success. And then for FCPS on, we have digital analytics and kinetics uh, as another piece of that. Another change to the fiscal 20 budget is a revision to elementary staffing standards. Um, budget staffing formulas have not been revised since well before the implementation of the school board elementary class size guidance. And I think it's important that you understand that our goals were, uh, as always, that we provide a base level of equity, that we provide some budget predictability to our principals by staffing uh, by meeting their staffing needs in the budget prior to the hiring season, not after the fact. We wanted to simplify things, continue the intent to provide more for high poverty um, schools, and address economies of scale. And the outcome of that is that we've designed a, a staffing standard that is efficient, equitable, reduces average class size um, in the fiscal 20 budget. So just going down this on the um, left-hand side of the screen is the fiscal 19 or the current year staffing standard and then on the right is the fiscal 20 proposed staffing standard. Kindergarten will change from a divisor of 27.25 with a FRM factor to a divisor of 25 and state K-3 program schools will have a max class size of 1924 based on state guidelines. Grades 1 through 6 will change from a divisor of 27.25 with the FRM with an FRM factor to a divisor between 20 and 26 based on poverty level and enrollment in grades one through six. And the staffing floor is no longer included in the formula. Immersion programs are gonna be staffed with one teacher position per upper grade level to ensure they aren't negatively impacted by attrition. Um, the immersion teachers are supplemental to the general ed teachers and um, we often end up having to allocate class size positions out of the staffing reserve because as they have attrition at those higher levels, um, we, we need to, to provide more staff to them. The AAP center will change from a divisor of 27.25 to a divisor of 26. And the ESOL staffing is changing from 20 positions per 1,000 students division-wide to 0.5 teacher per 37.5 students or one per 75 at the elementary level. Um, the ELL does result in um, less staffing, but that's due to ELL enrollment going down at the elementary, not the staffing standard. We kept the staffing standard um, flat as far as the amount of staffing that would be allocated uh, on a per pupil basis. So if you look at this next chart, we've got three examples of a small school with um, low uh, free and reduced um, eligible kids, a medium sized school and a large school. And you can see if you look at the one, two, third column over, what we did here is we said, okay, if we use the fiscal 19 staffing standard against the fiscal 20 enrollment, what would the result be? And so for the small school, you would get 14 teachers. And then in the far two right columns, it, we'd use the fiscal 20 staffing standard with the fiscal 20 enrollment. And of course, that results in 16 teachers for this small school example. Uh, at the middle school, same thing. Um, if we use the fiscal 19 and 20 projected enrollment, you'd get 32 teachers. Um, we get 33 with this new staffing standard and with the large school, 43. And we actually, it actually calculates to 44 um, with the new staffing standard. The majority of class size positions to push the class size down 
were previously being allocated from the staffing reserve um, and going to small and medium sized lower poverty schools who had the hardest time meeting the class size guidelines. The larger higher poverty schools have greater flexibility due to their economies of scale and their lower class sizes. Because these changes reduce the budgeted class size, the bulk of the staffing reserve positions um, added over the last three, three years have been repurposed to fund this change in the staffing standard. So um, let me cut to the chase. We had at the beginning, well, this is a system-wide impact, but it's still gonna show the same thing. The staffing adjustments with the new staffing standard require an additional 220.6 positions to elementary school gen ed staffing. Um, and they have been funded by a reduction to the staffing reserve positions um, since those positions are meant for improved class size. These positions will now be front loaded into the budget, providing hiring improvements and efficiency between the budget and the prevailing practices. Only five out of the 141 elementary schools were negatively impacted by the new staffing formulas, and they are all still anticipated to be able to meet the school board class size guidelines. Um, but we felt like there, and there wasn't really any commonalities among these five schools. I mean, the enrollment of these five schools ranged from 591 to 1,023. Um, their free and reduced percentages range from 44% to 84%. So there wasn't really any commonalities. But if you're going to change an entire formula, um, you generally are going to have a, a, few, a few groups that are not going to be, um, th that are going to be negatively impacted. So for this first year, um, we're proposing that these schools, these schools were also a little um, generously staffed in fiscal 19 which is, is why um, one of the reasons why it results in them having less staffing um, in fiscal uh, 20, but we're gonna hold them harmless in this first year to help them with the transition uh, and fund that out of the staffing reserve. So, you know, we've talked about the staffing reserve and the fact that, you know, we started with 441 positions and we used 220.6 to allocate the new elementary school staffing standard. That leaves a remainder of 220.4, and in an abundance of caution, we felt that we needed to add a replenishment of some positions um, to bring this number up just a little bit. And so we've included in the budget 4.3 million to fund 39.6 positions to bring that staffing reserve back up to 260. And that's slightly greater number of positions than we had prior to the initiation of the class size standards. Uh, a projected decline in enrollment of 1,343 is a result of the actual enrollment coming in lower than anticipated in fiscal 19. Now, you know, just to be clear, this is budget to budget. This is the amount of kids that we had in the projected fiscal 19 budget compared to fiscal 20 and you all saw this chart at mid-year. So that 1,343 um, students loss um, results in um, a reduction in, in, the, in the amount of staffing that we need that is related to enrollment, not the new staffing standard changes. Um, you also know, because I saw you saw this chart at mid-year, that air enrollment experience is consistent with neighboring jurisdictions. Fairfax, along with seven other uh, jurisdictions, is seeing contracting growth or even declines in the number of students. Um, I talked to Ms. Love class earlier today, and I think we've picked up 31 students um, since September 30. So that, that contraction is not continuing, but it's, it's very slow growth at this point. So as a result of that um, reduction in enrollment, we are expecting a savings of 6.3 million. Um, six assistant principals at the elementary school fell just under the, uh, the cusp or the standard of greater than 950 or greater than 76 instructional FTEs. Um, in fiscal 19, we added seven assistant principals 
that had just jumped over the cusp and now with an enrollment reduction, now they've jumped back under that cusp, which that to me uh, means that the assistant principal staffing center is something that we need to look at. We don't want that kind of disruption or that kind of swing happening. So if, if many schools are, are revving up against that, that cusp, then that is certainly something that we wanna look at in the future. As far as teachers go, we have less kids. We're gonna have 46 less teachers. Instructional assistants, a reduction of 12. ELL teachers, 28.5. Um, and again, we kept the pupil teacher ratio the same, but we, um, we're expecting about 1,300 less ELL students um, in fiscal 20 than we have in fiscal 19. Special education is going up about 350 kids, and so as a result, uh, they need additional teachers and technicians and instructional assistants. And we also have a slight change in office staff. Um, that's not something that I have, have looked at in any detail, um, but we will because again, um, that many may indicate that the, the staffing standard for uh, offices need to be looked at as well. I mean, all the staffing standards need to be looked at, um, but you know, we, I had grand plans uh, when I came in to look at many staffing standards uh, in this uh, fiscal 20 budget and uh, my, my talented staff brought me down to earth very quickly that we might not be able to do all of that uh, in the first year. So um, we looked at the ones that were the main ones for elementary school and then we have a list that we'll, we'll begin working on in the future. Um, as far as substitute pay goes, um, and again, I'm still on student success. Um, since student success can be impacted by the quality of substitutes, increases in retiree substitute pay was categorized in goal one. Um, we have a one million placeholder in the budget for changes uh, to retiree sub pay. And we concentrated on that because the number of retirees willing to substitute declined after the rate reduction in fiscal 16. So the chart here shows retiree rates, hourly rates. Oh, thank you. Um, back in 2016 when it was reduced significantly. So you can see short term back in 16 was 22.20 and then long term was 26.45. And then in fiscal 19, this current year, it's 15.48 and 22.12. Um, for fiscal 20, we've assumed in the budget uh, $20.50 for short term. So we're not back up at the level that we were in fiscal 16, but we're well above the market average using our normal comparators um, that we use um, for, for, for calculating the market average. On the long-term side, um, again, we're not quite reaching what it was in fiscal 16, but we're well above the market average. And I think um, Montgomery County is the only uh, division that's actually paying a greater long-term retiree sub rate than, than we are. Um, but you know, we're probably not competing with them um, because generally retirees are drawn back into the community that they worked for throughout their career. This is the second goal, uh, the caring culture, and this just provides more detail um, than what Dr. Brabrand's um, presentation uh, showed. Um, health insurance, although I think he pretty much went over these, um, they just weren't on the chart. So the health insurance, 2%, 5.2 uh, million in expenditures, the 2.9 million is a quarterly fund review adjustment that added um, 18 FTEs for mental health support, eight FTEs for safety and security training, and 6.5 FTEs for substance abuse prevention um, for a total of 2.9 million. There's also um, an increase of 200,000 for a position to support equity and positive student behavior support. Um, this, the skipped program, um, about 100,000, and then contractual services uh, increase in service contracts. And again, that's blown out on the next page. Um, basically, it's educational interpreters, school psychologists, skilled nursing services, and speech language services. The educational interpreters and school psychologists and speech language services are just supplements to our uh, normal positions when we can't. Uh, we're not always able to find all of the people that we need in the budget, and so we contract with organizations that can provide that support for us. The skilled nursing services is a little bit different. Um, 
basically this, is, you know, some of the nursing services are paid for by uh, Fairfax County Health Department and some are paid for by FCPS uh, if the IEP requires it. And so that one's a little bit different than the other three, but these are basically cost escalation increases uh, in our current service and uh, contracts for DSS. Now we're moving on to Premier Workforce, Goal 3. This chart should look familiar. It basically outlines, you know, all of the increases totaling $85.8 million in Premier Workforce. The next page gives you the primary drivers of the $80.1 million increase, which is the teacher salary scale enhancement, the step increases for eligible employees, the 1% um, MSA for non-teachers, and then the BA lane salary scale, and then the recurring cost of steps on the BA salary lane that was approved in a previous year. But the two largest increases are, of course, the scale enhancement and step increases. And these are offset, I didn't include it here, but these are offset by base savings um, that we have. So that's, that's how you get to the net number that you, that you saw. Um, this chart shows the implemented salary increases by schedule. Um, so you can see that in fiscal 18, as part of a compensation study, new salary skills uh, were developed for Schedule H and CIS, and they allowed, of course, for better alignment with the market. Um, and all scale changes were in support of the goal that all the salaries be between 95% and 105% of the uh, comparator market average. In fiscal 19, three new scales were designed to replace the unified scale uh, again, with the goal being to better align with the market. And then the teacher scale enhancement was the most costly. It was started in fiscal 18 and is completed in fiscal 20. On the far right are average increases by schedule and scale for fiscal 20. Teacher 6.23%, uh, um, ranging down to 2.5% for administrators. Also on premier workforce or other compensation increases, including an employee bonus placeholder of 600,000 for a 1% bonus for those employees who otherwise would not get a salary increase. And that's about 509 teachers and 275 instructional assistants. And we also included um, a small amount of parent liaison compensation to move um, parent liaisons that are working 20 to 24 hours a week um, into contracted hourly positions with full benefits. We've also assumed uh, a change to the hourly living wage from 1450 to 1483. Uh, the county currently has 1483 as the, the living wage, although they may very well in the uh, proposed budget um, propose an increase to that. But, you know, those kinds of things are, are, are highly guarded and I'm sure that even if I knew they wouldn't want me to announce it before they've announced it. So we're, we, we're usually a year behind them uh, with 1483. The retirement increases total 5.1 million. Uh, FCERS rate increases are going from 27.14 to 28.35, and that costs about 2.4 million. And then ERFC is going from 6.26 to 6.44, and that's 2.7 million. BRS rates are unchanged. And then the last thing um, that we have um, is the equity employee relations support, and that's 700,000 for um, EER support positions. Um, they'll provide investigative uh, expertise and support to the regions, um, as well as training and ensure timely response to complaints uh, about Title IX, civil rights, those sorts of things. This scale is the original endpoint of teacher salary scale enhancement, teacher salary scale enhancement that was, I guess, introduced in uh, fiscal 17 funded in fiscal 18 for the first time and is included in the fiscal 20 budget. Again, funding began in fiscal 18 and concludes in 20. The final pay scale provided fewer steps on the bachelor's lanes than the other lanes. It consolidated the BA plus 15 and BA 30 lanes with increased step values for those lanes. And the number of steps was originally reduced so that all employees would uh, receive faster career earnings. And this final schedule is what is included in the fiscal 20 proposed budget. This chart, chart shows the career earnings each year of the implementation. Um, the future scale represents FCPS career earnings based on the scale included in the fiscal 20 budget. 
and compare using that scale compared to the fiscal um, 20 estimated market average of the comparators, we're at or slightly under the market. So we are recommending a change to the teacher pay scale that is proposed in the budget. The revised scale is displayed here and will have 23 steps for all teacher pay lanes. Steps 20 to 23 for BA, steps 20 to 23 for BA 15, and steps 20 to 23 for BA, and BA 30 have all been added back. Teachers at the top of the scale will receive a 1% bonus in fiscal 20, and in subsequent years, um, assuming that you know we're able to afford a step plus an MSA, that MSA would be applied to all steps, including the top step. The number of steps continues to be reduced for all employees to provide faster career earnings. The plan for consolidation of BA 15 plus BA 30 will no longer be considered. And with this revised proposed teacher scale, grandfathering will be unnecessary. All teachers will be on the same scale. The changes are in italics uh, and in bold on the chart that you can see. And this revised schedule has an increased cost of a million dollars in fiscal 20. We are recommending an increase in the beginning balance coming from the current year to fund it in the first year and it'll be built into the base thereafter. And again, it's important to note that 23 steps for everyone, no consolidation of BA 15 and BA 30, um, no grandfathering, everybody on the same scale, and MSA in the future will be applied to the top scale as well as the other scales on the lane. And we've had a very favorable response from our teacher associations with the new scale. Again, this chart shows the career earnings each year, the implementation. The future scale now represents, um, based on the revised scale that I just talked to you about, with the 23 steps across the board, no consolidation, and the career earnings of this scale results in a scale that is between 98 and 103% of the estimated market average of all comparators, which just for the record is DC, Montgomery, Prince George's Loco, um, Loudoun County, Arlington, Alexandria, and Prince William. And I also included um, the comparison to the Virginia market only, which would exclude DC, Montgomery, and PG. And it's between 98% and 101% if you look at the Virginia divisions only. Moving on to goal four, which is resource stewardship. Um, this just provides a little bit more detail um, on resource stewardship. Again, the 1.4 million in utilities, um, slight savings in school construction fund of about 300,000. And then the contractual services of 4.9 million is detailed on the next page. And it basically consists of mostly um, FTS, uh, facilities and transportation uh, services department and technology. I think one item for human resources, it says IDM, and I meant to spell that out and didn't, but IDM means integrated disability management. And that basically um, addresses it's in the benefits office, short-term disability, long-term disability, FMLA, and other leaves that might be impacted by disability. I should have spelled that out. So that's, that's the one thing in the middle that's just about 17,000, I think. Yeah, 17,331. Um, the facilities and transportation services are uh, primarily have to do with the, the radios for the, um, the buses and the public safety system, the lease at Willow Oaks, um, Previously, we haven't been paying a lease at Willow Oaks, and we that that first bill is going to come due uh, in fiscal 20, and it's about $944,000. So we had to increase that um, in in the facilities budget. We also have an increase of a half a million for maintenance supplies and 200,000 for custodial supplies, uh, and then bus operations about 300,000. So about 3.4 million of this list is facilities and transportation. Um, on the IT side, it's mostly software licenses for, um, let's see, uh, Novell, Azure, Lawson, Oracle, and Web Methods. And then there was a change in licenses for Adobe and Microsoft. We used to, we used to be able to purchase an enterprise license, and we're not going to be able to do that anymore. And so we're seeing increases in both of those. There's also a little bit of increase um, for the bandwidth and internet access. 
The last chart is the revenue overview, and I pulled the textbook reserve set aside out, hoping that this would, would make more sense. It's been below the line, moved below the line so that the expenditure total balances with the revenue totals. Um, we do not have a surplus of 2.8 million. It represents funding set aside for the textbook replacement reserve um, that is funded with county transfer. So the 81.6 is the is not really the county transfer request, it's the 84.4 that was on the original. But that is made up of 81.6 of county transfer to fund the school operating fund and 2.8 million for the textbook reserve set aside. So the total that we're requesting is 84.4. The gap is still 2.4 million as, as Dr. Bray Rand uh, spoke about when he uh, did his budget. Um, I, I recognize that um, our explanation of this and, and how it works with the expenditures is a little clunky, um, and we're going to fix that in fiscal 21 because this is the only reserve that resides outside the school operating fund, and we are going to put that in the school operating fund as a reserve in fiscal 21 um, because it's very confusing to everybody. It's confusing, it's confusing to me. I know it was confusing to some of you all. And um, this is just a real clunky way to handle it, in my opinion. And so we're going to move that to the school operating fund. The next chart basically just shows the dates. We have public hearings coming up the 28th, 29th, and 30th, uh, if all three days are needed. On the 31st, we have the televised budget work session over at Luther Jackson. And then on February 7th, is when the school board will make amendments and adopt the fiscal 20 advertised budget. That's it. Thank you so much for um, enlightening us on the points and uh, thank you uh, for the many changes uh, that uh, well, not the many changes, I should say, but the, the changes in particular. I'm particularly pleased to see what happened with the DA lanes and how you've handled that and your suggestion to us. So I really appreciate that. And my colleagues have several questions, I'm sure. Um, Ms. Mr. Moon, followed by Ms. Palchik, followed by Ms. Hines. I try to abide by three-minute rule. <laughs> so I'm going to ask quickly. and then <laughs> uh, Thank you for the presentation. I I'm, I used to be much better with the numbers, maybe not anymore. Uh, but with that $2.8 million, you are setting it, setting aside for taxable reserve. I still have a hard time understanding because if I don't understand, I'm not going to be able to explain to a constituents. So probably I need private tutoring session from you. That's one. With a home, uh, hold harmless of those, is it five schools, six schools? Elementary school we talked about? Five schools. I, I'm i glad that we are we are planning on holding them harmless for the next school year. But I also remember, I also remember that many years ago when we uh, were holding schools harmless, it wasn't just a one year approach, it could be multi year approach as well. So uh, I know we are only dealing with FI 20 budget. Uh, when we talk about FI 21 budget, please, if I forget to ask you, if I am fortunate enough to get back to stay on the school board, I may come back and ask you whether you consider uh, giving them maybe another, you know, 50% of that decreased staffing as uh, reduce the impact of, of a losing, a losing, you know, teachers. So taking two year approach rather than just doing it one time. And per, I perhaps want to know, uh, you know, there are what, six principals, six elementary schools are losing, assistant principals want to know with, with the names of schools, and uh, whether there is a way for us to, again, taking a home, hold harmless approach to those schools, want to know what the cost will be. To the uh, in educational interpreters, how many full-time educational interpreters do we have? Somebody told me two for the entire county. Okay, so oh, we have more than that, Teresa. I, I don't have an exact number for you, but it's close okay. in the hundreds. 
Okay, because what I heard that for the entire county, there was only two full-time as well. I, I didn't have any any other information to rebut that, so I would like to know. That was less than three minutes, Madam was the Chair. You have 43 seconds, very good. Next. Next is Miss. Next is Miss Palchik. All right, I will try to be as brief as. Oh, well, not yet. Miss Burden's can, responding. Can we answer? Oh, okay. Um, as as far as the textbook reserve, we included your question about the textbook reserve from um, January 10th as a budget question. So you'll get a more uh, full explanation then that hopefully will will. Um, I guess I'll take that as declining my request for one-to-one -one tutoring session. But that's okay. I'll read, I'll we read first. We can do both. We can do both. Um, as far as the five, year, the five schools that we're going to hold harmless in this uh, first year, it, it'll, be a different, it'll be different schools next year. It could be none next year that... Well, I'm only referring to those five elementary schools yeah. who have been losing yeah. staff. Yeah. Um, and we, we can get you the um, name of the schools who is, are losing APs. We'll have to bring that back, as and as well as the uh, educational interpreters. Yeah, we'll and have to bring I, when that you back. when you bring back the list of the elementary schools losing a AP positions, I also want to know from, you know, one number to one number whether it's a four principal AP to three or three to two or two to one. Yeah. Dr. Duran has. But wait, a, let me defer to yeah, staff because. Go ahead, and then Dr. Duran has something. Uh, we do not have any elementary schools with more than two APs, so all of them would be going from two to one, and we don't have any elementary schools that don't get an AP. So, in the case of losing an AP, it would be from two to one. There is a dual elementary with a three. Every, I know that every every elementary school has a one, a, one AP, and there is no school with a three. If a school has three APs, it's because they used some of their own money to purchase okay. a third AP, okay. or there was some kind of so we'll be all unusual from two to, All from two to one. One to two, yep. Okay. You know, going f you know, from two to one is a drastic change in, in my mind for the workload for AP. Mr. Moon, I just wanted to but, clarify for the interpreters. We were talking about educational interpreters. That would be our sign, American Sign Language, cued speech interpreters. We have about 120 of them. Uh, some of the challenge has been hiring interpreters and our contracted services tend to increase year to year and some of that is due to cuts in those interpreters over the course of the last five years or so. Not, not language interpreters. Correct. Not, not multi-language interpreters. I, I was talking about multi-language interpreters. That's Okay, okay. My question is actually for, was for the language multi-language interpreters. Okay, where if there seems to be <laughs> that may have caused some confusion because it, I'm a little confused on that one. But we'll we're we're going to go forward and uh, we can have these questions. And addressed. we will get that answer for you. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Smith, Miss um, Palchik. Yes, thank you. I will try to be brief. I have some of Mr. Moon's questions. A few, I, I think I'm still waiting. I hope I, I entered my uh, formal budget questions, both around custodial services, around multilingual interpreters. Um, I think staff is working on that. Um, and then I have a few more I would like us to discuss today. So um, uh, the custodial... Um, staffing which is schedule a correct i believe uh on slide 19. um you know I, after meeting with our uh support staff i would like to to have a start to look at how we um our trades facilities custodians have uh, their salary skills and how we're uh, staffing them i know you're starting to look at staffing formulas for the future um, but i will be bringing forward um, once i get more budget um, my budget question answered um, to see how our staffing is affected and I guess on sorry on slide eight when you talk about custodians I'm trying to slide up sorry uh, for custodial is that a change to the staffing formula or or is that the current staffing formula 
Is that under the same square footage? It's just we've increased square footage, so we're increasing well, staffing? Well, my understanding is the custodial staff is allocated um, based on a formula that considers the number of staff, enrollment, and square footage. So since we've uh, this new staffing standard at the elementary level adds staff, then some schools were apparently eligible for additional custodians as a result of that. Okay, so I guess I would like to know both now, for- Now, having yeah. said that, if you look over on the next page, mm -hmm. the, it, the enrollment reductions resulted in a loss of custodial staff, um, I think, on that page. So I guess I would like to add, maybe following up um, Mr. Moons, but a little bit broader, um, both gains and losses by school of um, staffing um, as listed in these slides uh, so we can get a breakdown of how that is impacting schools because I know several of my very large schools uh, do purchase additional assistant principals in order to be able to support their large capacity um, or their large enrollment. So I would like uh, to ask that question. Uh, the IA contract, it's come to my attention in our last calendar meeting um, with elementary school principals, and I, I think they're bringing a proposal that due to the fact that next year we will not have any half days in the calendar um, for professional development, that IAs will not be able to attend because they are not contracted. Is that correct? Michael, I think, Mr. Drager. Yeah, the teacher contract is 194 days. So with a 180 day student calendar, there's 14 additional days for PD activities or teacher work days. And the instructional assistant work schedule is 190 days. So it is four days shorter. So there are four days during the year where teachers are in the buildings for PD activities or teacher work days, but IA staff are not. Or not, okay. Um, so I guess I, I will- Patrick, yeah. Yeah. yeah, your time's up oh, right now. Oh, I'm sorry, okay. All right. I'll do yeah, a you go, can go back. back. I shouldn't I'll have let them answer. Uh, all right. Strategy. <laughs> Long We're all going to learn to strategize. <laughs> Miss Hines, talk carefully. Thank you. I know, right? Okay. So uh, for, for my colleagues, um, I just wanted to say I'm eyeing that $6 million flexible money that might be there. We hope will be there. Um, and I've already asked a budget question about um, AARTs for Title I schools, I'm thinking about, yeah, I'm sure that's coming. Um, I'm also going to um, ask two questions tonight about um, three full-time permanent positions for the Get to Green program. We currently have three people basically working on it, two in instructional services, one sort of in facilities. Um, but I just, I'm going to ask how much you know, how we're funding them now and how much it would cost to make those um, three full-time permanent positions. So that's the other thing I'm thinking about for the $6 million, just so you know. Um, my question's for staff. When we get to the, the sub-pay, I think it's slide 14. This is not going to be popular for me to say, but we have to be fiscally responsible. Um, we have two uh, amounts, though, that are well above market average. Um, I think uh, these are retiree pay, you know. Um, Short term at twenty fifty uh, an hour, where market average is seventeen dollars an hour, and long term at twenty six, where market average is twenty three. And so, I think I may ask some budget questions about, um, you know, what, dip, well, how much would we save if we went to eighteen dollars an hour for short term instead, and say twenty four dollars an hour for long term instead, and maybe when when I stop talking, <laughs> if you have sort of a ballpark of what that difference would be, it would help me, but um, I, I think we should at least think about that. And then finally, my last question. On um, slide five, you mentioned uh, in your discussion under VPI that this $650,000 will be covered by the governor's budget if the governor's budget is enacted by the General Assembly. I was just wondering, is there anything else in the budget that if the governor's budget passes will also be covered, or is this the only thing that you're presenting tonight that's in that category? Well, it's it's covered, but we've already included it as being covered. So we've we've fully included all of the governor's um, revenue for uh, FCPS in the superintendent's proposed budget. Okay, so I'm sorry. So that's 650 there. If the governor's budget is enacted, approved, um, are we going to have an extra 650 in our budget or not? That's no, not, no. Okay, no. 
if, if it, it's not approved, we would need 650. Right. In fact, if I could clarify, if we don't get the governor's budget and we go back to what we got from the state last year, we're talking millions of dollars less. So I, I don't know. Uh, I'm sure we could, as a budget question, get you the differential from last year to, to now. But it's a significant amount. It's not 650000 It's several million. It's a $36 million dollar increase. Okay, so yeah, we should, let's say that again, $36 million, because as we're advocating now with our state delegation down $36 there. $36 million. $36 million, thank you. My other question was about subpay. Should I just propose, should I just say uh, that go as back. a budget question? Uh, or, or you could even go back. Yeah, I mean, we'll have to calculate it. We can calculate that and provide that. Ms. Corbett Sanders. It, Oops, so go ahead, Mr. Smith. And, and if I may about the subpay, we were looking at uh, the, those teachers who weren't coming back to sub and which basically were the retirees and noted that we could increase our fill rates by 2% if those individuals did come back. And it was, uh, it's conversations with our teacher associations about those rates uh, and knowing that those were the rates that our teachers had been comfortable with and felt that those would be the rates that would bring those teachers back to the sub pool. Go ahead, Ms. Corbett Sanders. Thank you. Um, and I will use about 30 seconds to um, send out a great thank you to the budget team um, and how they have presented this year's budget. I know that my community, I was at a uh, Council of Civic Associations meeting this past week, and they were just thrilled with the transparency, the added transparency in the budget. So thank you. I do have a couple of questions. Um, I am concerned about the changes in our general ed staffing and the impact on the five schools, uh, two of which are not in my magisterial district, but they feed into the middle and high schools in our magisterial district. And so um, I am concerned about that. When you couple it with, I understand there are 20 positions that have been cut as a result of Title I funding being reduced. And so I have sent a number of questions to you. Um, I, you don't need to answer them tonight because I know I sent them over the, week, over the weekend, but um, I am going to be very interested in how we can restore um, the services to those Title I schools in particular that have been impacted. Um, I very much uh, welcome the uh, changes to the BA lanes. As you know, this has been an issue that I raised even when it was first proposed a few years ago. And so I think that this is uh, helpful. It would be nice um, to understand if we do this, um, where Fairfax County salaries are compared to our neighbors. Um, it's my understanding that we may be the um, at the top of the market uh, right now compared to our neighbors. And so this is exactly where we want to be. Uh, we want to attract the best and the brightest. And when we put this coupled with our, um, our other compensation um, and benefits, this is, this is wonderful. Um, last, I see the projected enrollment that you've presented here on um, our alternative programs and our special ed. They seem to be decreasing on this slide. Uh, but in the budget book, there seems to be an increase. And so if somebody could um, get back to me as to why they're, they are um, decreasing here and increasing in the budget book, that would be helpful. Um, and with that, I will hold off on further questions because I know you all are coming back to me um, with answers to the questions that I posed over the weekend. Is there anything you want to answer now, budget team? Uh, just with regards to your last question about the special education enrollment, uh, the slide is showing only students with level two special education services, which would be those receiving service for more than half of their school day, whereas the overall increase is related to students any student with a special ed IEP, which could include students who receive services for less than half the day. So there's a, there's a decrease in the number of the most severely, you know, the, the amount of time, you know, 50% or more, but there's an increase in the overall number of total special education students. 
And so those special education students include students with IEPs and 504s? Uh, 504s are not included at all. Okay. Um, so on... Can I offer a suggestion that you actually clarify that in the budget document because there is some confusion when you have different numbers floating around? And sure. so just uh, for our, the benefit of the members of the board as well as our constituents, I think that's important. All right, Ms. Evans. Hi, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for the excellent presentation. I uh, certainly support um, uh, fi fixing the you know the the solution on the BA uh, uh, lane at the at the top uh, scale, restoring the steps. I will say I am a bit surprised to see us restoring an entire lane, um, and I'm seeing that up until step 19 it's really only worth about $500 to um, employees and then it leaps up in the last four steps so I'm gonna have to ponder that a bit I um, I, I guess I'd, I'd like to ask because we did have a long conversation about the uh, lanes and uh, consolidating too because the uh, the feeling was that we had too many lanes but so um, as far as the rationale for that I would be interested in that but um, more my major questions have to do with the formula and um, I, I do have some questions and some concerns and not just about the temporary issue with Hybla Valley if you look at page six um, it looks like the the small wealthy school gets the biggest boost from this formula the middle-sized 48% uh, FRM school gets uh, little or nothing and then the, the high FRM school um, gets, but with a, a large school, gets one. So this does raise a question in my mind of how this formula is ultimately panning out. And particularly when of the five schools that are not receiving the same amount of staffing, some of these are among our highest poverty schools and and like Ms. Corbett Sanders none of these are in in Mason district in my district but um, you know we're looking at 92% uh, poverty 85% poverty 83% poverty um, so I, that does give me a concern about what you know what what the ultimate um, impact of this formula is going to be uh, particularly when I, I see that we now go down to 20% we we had changed that formula so those with less than 25% didn't get needs-based staffing and now I see that if you're ab above 20% you do get needs-based staffing is that correct I mean well let me ask all my questions um, I'm also seeing that there's no difference between a 50% FRM rate and an 80% FRM rate whereas in reality the difference between 50% and 80% is huge um, and then when you go to the 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 larger schools there's no difference between 60 percent and, and 80 percent it's all the same so I'm I'm a little concerned that this formula may be not providing as much as it should at the top FRM level so I, I would like to get a little bit more clarity on that and also making sure that this whatever we this is needs-based staffing correct we're talking just this, this formula is for needs-based staffing our needs-based staffing so let's getting clarity that this would not reduce Title I funding. Uh, it would it would be it wouldn't um, supplant Title I funding. And then lastly, so, um, I agree with Ms. Corbett Sanders. I believe Ms. Corbett Sanders and I will probably be combining on on an amendment to try to restore uh, Title I positions, uh, which you know it's not not our Evans, fault. But yes, your time. Okay. So um, th those are the points I'd like to make. If you had any uh, response to any of them. We'll, we'll have to research it get back with you on on these but, but there's no impact on title one funding with the staffing standard change at all and, and I can I can write another budget question but I I do you know my main point is I have concerns about the formula not providing as much as it might at the upper levels of FRM mr. McElveen followed by miss McLaughlin Thank you. Um, f first, on the issue of interpreters that w was raised, um, I would expect that with uh, the increase of interest in taking ASL, 
that we would have more opportunities for student internships in that area, potentially paid, you know, um, after school. I think that's an exa an area where we could explore. Um, uh, one question for um, Mary Beth's shop is on um, the enterprise contracts. I'd be interested in the mechanics that have have led to us. Um, having to pay this this hefty fee now, um, and look forward to hearing more about that from you. Um, I agree with Sandy on the uh, BA lanes. I'm I'm thrilled to see the 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 first lane restored. Um, I'm a little um, perplexed as to why we're also restoring um, the the other lanes after the effort to um, to to condense things. Um, and then. Um, one question I have is uh, for for Lee is um, when you talk about the minimum wage issue, is there anything that would prevent us from outpacing the county on that um, and um, raising it to a higher level than than what they are pursuing? You talked about how um, you know we'd wait to wait and see what they did before we did. Why couldn't we take the lead on that? So those are my questions. I'd be grateful for answers. Well, I mean. The living wage, like, means something. I mean, there's, like, the right number for Fairfax County in this day and age. So I don't know if we'd want to arbitrarily, I mean, we'd have to do some research on, you know, the what, I, what I'm saying is our, our the, 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 rate, the, the wage that we adopt can at, certainly outpace that that the county puts forward as the, the jurisdictional minimum wage, right? Dr. Yes, Brand wants to speak. Yes. I just want to say we can do the research. This board this board can set policy to say we want to do living wage, living wage plus two, living wage. I mean, so we've been playing catch up. If the board wants to go beyond, we can talk about that. And I, I will say, you know, we, I've had some discussions with folks in the community and some folks in associations like as much as the studies, th those who've been around, the, the true cost of living here, even when you think $15 an hour is just not a lot of money. So we're, we're, we're certainly w willing to listen to the board about where to go on that, and we'd want to pull some more studies, but I, it's where does the board, do we want to pace with the county? Do we want to pace with living wage, whatever that number is, or do we want to try to go like we might as Mr. Moon had said earlier, do we want to meet the market or go above the market? Do we want to meet the living wage or go above it? Those are to me policy questions. And um, with the board feedback, we can make adjustments in the budget based on your your insights. I don't think there's any reason that we can't uh, go beyond what what a number is um, that's already been established as the living wage. All right, thank you. Um Ms. McLaughlin. I had that question about enterprise contracts, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you, can you clarify which contract you had a question so on? So like, like uh, Microsoft and some of these, these others. So Microsoft and Adobe have changed the way their educational pricing is done. And this is a nationwide, I've talked to a lot of my colleagues, including Montgomery County and, and all of them. They no longer have enterprise licenses where you have unlimited usage by students and staff. So now it's based on a per site usage. So we've gone back to all of our, our staff and and determine which people actually need. For example, with the Adobe, you have the reader, but a lot of staff also need the full-blown Adobe contracts. So the way the contract pricing works, it's just a completely different way they're doing education pricing now nationwide. So it's causing us to have, we've cut back on the number of, of licenses, but still it's a slight increase of about $35,000 a year will be more based on the number of licenses that we need to do the instructional programs. Are you all right, Mr. McElveen? With the, uh, okay. I'm Ms. McLaughlin. All right, starting the clock. Uh, I'll just hit on as many as I can for now. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, uh, I wanted to share with my colleagues that we had a really good discussion about equity um, among uh, our schools for funding of students and depending on poverty levels. And we talked about gate receipts and... Uh, PTA booster funding and all that. But one thing that occurred to me that I've been uncomfortable with for many, many years now is our student parking fees. And if you talk about inequity, uh, who, who the student parking fees that Fairfax County charges compared to, uh, compared to Montgomery County and Prince George's County, I mean, they pretty much charge you a sticker fee of about $25. 
and we're charging, I think it's 250. And think about it, depending on the footprint of your high school, then you have that many parking spaces to sell and that much revenue to keep at that building. Then if you have wealth and families who can pay for the parking fee, then you're also selling those parking passes. But if not, then the students are parked on the streets. And I was just passing Oakton High School the other day and was amazed at the number of students. And I know they're going through construction, but all those kids parked on the street. What a nuisance for the roadway, the neighbors, unsafe. Um, and even at Woodson, we are blessed with an incredible amount of parking space. Families don't want to pay it. And the kids park on the roadway and the neighborhoods. And honestly, these are tax paying families. We don't charge our employees, thankfully, to park at their workplace. Why are we charging these kids to park where they're going to school to be educated? They save us money when we don't have to put them on a bus because they're providing their own transportation and their neighbors and their younger siblings. It goes on. So I wanted you all to know that we're not going to be able to necessarily talk about it tonight is a budget question that I'm going to send in. So hopefully we can talk about it on the 31st. But to my colleagues, I wanted to put the marker down. For too long, we've, we've made excuses for the, the parking fees and that, you know, it is a nice way for certain schools to get added revenue that I know our principals need. And maybe we have to have a conversation about it. But you talk in equity. It is across our 25 high schools. There is a vast difference between who's getting money on parking fees and who doesn't. Um, the other thing is that I mentioned earlier um, at one of our work sessions about substitute usage. This is the time in our budget um, this year where we're not scrambling around trying to cut, 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 that we have to be talking about how can we be more efficient and effective with our spending. And um, our substitute costs uh, have grown exponentially, probably within just the last decade alone. And so I, I will be putting in a budget question to understand that. Um, when we couldn't afford to give raises to some of our employees under Dr. Garza's leadership, one of the things she did for teachers was, we can't give you a raise, but we'll give you a couple of extra days. Well, now we've committed to salaries. We need to be looking at what substitute usage does to the learning in the classroom. So now my time is up and just put me on the list. All right, thank you. Are there any questions you may answer now or? Let me do one, parking fees. Parking fees go all the way back to the 1990s when we had our first budget issue and we slapped those on. And then every time we've had a tough budget process, we've simply just added to that number. Um, I mean, we have had the discussion about putting the equity lens on all things. And I think if you put a market lens on our parking fees, we are much higher than other school systems. So uh, I recognize that and frankly, <laughs> I, I appreciate that part of the conversation. I'm, I'm not going to say further since my own children will be eligible to uh, pay those fees next year. I don't want to look like I'm going to probably have to recuse myself from that discussion, um, but I get it. Um, and uh, you made another point that I wanted to respond, but I can't remember what it was. The, the substitute usage. We have been trying to track that and see what is going to be a lever um, that can, the, the pool shrunk when we cut back the rate the pool shrunk. So what can we do to get the pool back up? Um, and I understand the other point about in tough times that we did extend the days. Um, you know, that's a tough discussion. Our, our teachers, when we talk wellness about students, we're trying to talk wellness about our staff too and figuring out the right balance and what's the appropriate amount of leave for a, a personal leave for a teacher to have, um, you know, is a conversation we can certainly have. But Mari, do you have a point on that one? Well, and this is a, a short-term look at our substitute issue. We are going to continue to, to take a long-term look at our issues around substitutes and our issues around leave. So this is something that we'll continue to do, pull together our, uh, our teacher associations, our principal associations to have those discussions, uh, but really wanting to see what we could do with the monies that we had set aside this year in the budget uh, to have an impact on subs for next year was to look at the 900,000 for uh, the retiree salaries and then take a longer look at some of the things that you were talking about, Ms. McLaughlin. All right, Ms. Strauss. Uh, thank you. Um, several questions, I'll ask them first. We don't run out of time. 
on the BA lanes, did we then not consolidate the earlier steps in order to give people um, a higher salary earlier in their career? Question one. Uh, two, I am pleased to see holding harmless on the number of schools. Two of them, Coates and Hutchison, are mine. Very needy, very, very needy schools. And um, just for everybody's information, Coates is number two in student mobility in the county. Um, the only school that is higher is um, uh, Fort Belvoir. Um, and the, the sub pay, I am glad to see the increase because that was uh, a number of my schools had huge issues over inability to get subs. So thank you. And if you could answer my question on the, uh, on the BA lane scale. Yeah, we tried to remain as um, close to the original final um, salary scale as possible. And so the only changes that we made were to um, continue the scale to 23 steps based on what was there in the fiscal 17 schedule, as well as we added $500 to the BA 30 so that it was slightly more than BA 15. And then we moved them up to 23. So are the earlier steps still accelerated in pay so that teachers get more yeah, money? Yes, yeah. so okay. we didn't make any changes to the other, uh, the overall scale. We only made those changes to the areas that are uh, in bold and italic. So it's the same methodology for uh, larger increases at the beginning of your career, smaller at the end. There's a, a bit of a shift for our BA lanes where you have larger increases at the beginning, It you have smaller increases, and then when you get to uh, step 19 to 20, you then see some larger increases. So uh, it, it's you know, by adding those additional steps back into the scale, using the previous methodology, but wanting to get our folks to where uh, they were in the FY16 scale, uh, it took some maneuvering to do that. Uh, but we felt that this was the best way to do that uh, while keeping the overall uh, integrity as close to what we had originally planned. Okay, great. Thank you. Ms. Strauss, I call this the back to the future BA lanes revision. We tried to make a change. The communication about it when I got here was such that many people felt they didn't understand what was happening. Then when we brought you the work session in the fall, we looked at trying to have a scale, then grandfather and put people back on another scale. It was confusing to you. It was confusing to our teacher associations. And frankly, we decided the most simplistic piece is to go back to where we were, restore the lanes and add the steps back. Everybody wins and everybody knows where they were and they're back on. And so we think this is the cleanest approach um, and uh, we'll be glad to ask additional questions, but it was just the simplest to understand and to communicate than having people meander on a, on a lane, back off a lane and then back again. Um, and so we made a change then we tried to fix the change by making it more complicated, and we felt like let's go back to simplicity and restore it to what it was. And I assume our employees are happy with this. We had a meeting. Uh, Mr. Smith had a meeting with the associations on Friday, and I, as I understand, had a very positive um, interaction. But I'll let I'll let Mr. Smith and those folks speak for themselves. Yeah, no, it was a very positive interaction with our associations. I see Mr. Hickerson in the back giving us the hands up. Uh, so it was a very positive meeting with our teacher associations, uh, feeling that we had listened and that it's much more uh, understandable and that it brings those employees back to where uh, they thought they would be. The, the piece that is uh, uh, that, that we feel will help us going forward is that if the board chooses in future years to provide uh, MSAs for those at the top of the scale, that everyone receives uh, those MSAs at the top of the scale. All right, looking around, any colleagues have additional questions? I have three go backs. Um, they are Ms. Pacek. Ms. Evans, did you have a go back? I know I had to cut you off, so I'm not sure if you had a go back. Okay, so it's just Ms. Pacek and Ms. McLaughlin. Um, okay, before we do go backs, Mr. Wilson does want to speak first. Uh, thank you. Um, one question on the substitute pay. Uh, when it was changed a couple of years ago, the, um, the HR folks thought that there wouldn't be an issue in re in recruiting and, and, re and, and finding the substitutes uh, under the new pay scale. That, I think, proved to be not true, as 
Dr. Brabrand said, we, we now have a way to fill that substitute reservoir. Um, is, is it the expectation that with the adjustment back that we will succeed in filling that or, is, or do, we, do we think that's enough or do we think this is this, what's our expectation? Because we were, we had the, I think we had a miss expectation before. We were expecting that we would be able to even if the, at the different pay and we will, that turned out not to be true. Sure, the thinking now is that ultimately the um, retirees are still uh, invested and interested in working with the division. The, the rub with them was that we did decrease the rate of pay. Um, so going in this direction, the thought is that we'll be able to get those individuals to return to the pool uh, with um, expectation that they will help us to make up some of the okay. lost ground in terms of our, our fill rate. Uh, we're expecting our, our, that we would see approximately a 2% increase in our fill rates if those individuals that left the pool since the decline in the rates returned. Okay. And, and if I could add, we were looking at numbers, of course, uh, but I think that when you calculate uh, human behavior uh, into the whole equation, we're uh, based on the feedback that we've received from our retirees, uh, that uh, while those rates were above market, the teachers felt uh, wanted to feel valued uh, in terms of having that those years of expertise. And so uh, we feel that this will show that they are indeed valued at the same level they were before and are hoping that the behavior will change and that they will come back into the fold uh, as substitutes. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. I, 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 don't, I know we're using the three-minute rule, so i got to be careful with the too, yeah, yes. too long of answers. But um, uh, I do appreciate that. I guess the question I have is in the – when we saw that we were having the difficulties in finding the substitutes, were certain types of substitutes harder to find than others? Should we be thinking about differentiating? Because I have heard feedback from retiree substitutes. They were, they were very unhappy about the change in pay, and for that reason, I didn't support it. I think that they deserve they deserved better at the time uh, and, a, and a better approach. But I do wonder whether or not um, maybe there are certain subspecialties that we need to target uh, because I think there are certain substitute positions that I think probably are harder to fill. So I think that's part of our long-term approach to the situation is to take a deeper dive and looking at where we are struggling specifically um, Ultimately, there may be certain subject areas where we need to, um, you know, potentially study and look at uh, making a differentiation, but we're not ready or prepared to make that recommendation this evening. And, and uh, the, Mr. Just, Wilson, your time was up. I can put you on for a go back. I appreciate that, Madam Chair. All right, and we will start our go backs with Ms. Palchik. Thank you. I will ask them all quickly um, and then let you answer. Uh, the first one, I don't think this has been brought up, but um, again, I'd like to ask um, the proposal for, I know for next year, for having the bonus versus the MSA for our top of scale. I think the recommendation you're proposing now is to hold off on the MSA for another year. Um, so I guess I would like to get the cost analysis, uh, the cost differential. I know it's different. It will add up, understandably. There will be next year's costs and the future costs, but I guess the delta between, for us, doing the MSA versus the bonus for one year. Let me ask all of them, sorry. <laughs> uh, my other question, and I will follow up with these. Um, the Metro bus pass at uh, the Justice High School pilots, I've had many at Falls Church ask about how we're uh, planning to expand that. So I know this is a multi-group partnership so if we could just get, I'll, and I will ask it formally, more information uh, about the program, how it's funded, and if there are plans for expansion, I don't, if any of that comes from us or from other sources. Um, and then I don't think they've been listed, but for the, the other salary scales, especially for our custodial and other su support um, positions, if we could get the, the starting salary, and I don't know if it's possible I guess I would like to sort of get a graph to see how those look, the way we've done for teachers and, and kind of what it would take to make that possible. Um, and I think that's all for now. Thank you. Well, the cost for um, 
We've got $600,000 as a placeholder for the 1% bonus for the employees that are at the top of the scale and otherwise wouldn't receive um, a monetary increase. So the cost to do a 1% MSA is only a couple hundred thousand more because basically you've now taken dollars that are not uh, subject to VRS, FICA, um, and other little percentages, and suddenly it is if you make it part of the salary. So it's a couple hundred thousand. It's usually about 30%. So you're going to, that, that number would go up a couple hundred thousand as a result of that. But then, you know, then your salary schedule, um, step is movement on the schedule and, you know, MSA, COLA, MRA, whatever you want to call it, is applied to the schedule. And because we've been in a teacher enhancement, the dollar amounts have changed, but unlike historically, they've changed by varying amounts depending on what we were trying um, to achieve. So to just go in and layer on 1% on that top step was would then throw things out of whack, to use a technical term. <laughs> and, and what we will see then the following year, once we are once the new scale is fully implemented, that everyone will go back to what we were doing before, where when we applied the MSA, it would be applied equally across the entire scale. So uh, in the future, after next year, uh, if the board would choose to do an MSA, we wouldn't have to worry about any bonuses for employees. So this would be the last year that we would have the $600,000 in the budget for bonuses. In the future, it would all move toward uh, MSAs for all employees. Okay, I will follow up with you more on that because I know it was, you know, not very helpful for many of our employees to get that bonus. Um, and I know some asked for a smaller MSA. I know that was a conversation we had. So I will follow up with that. Um, and then should I make the other questions, formal ones around the Metro Bus Pass program and our salary scales for our other schedules? Then, I mean, we've got... We're writing them down, but yeah, no, if you I'll want send to just send an you. email, that's fine. Perfect. Thank you. Ms. McLaughlin. Okay. Um, going back to my list, um, I did want to raise the issue with my colleagues and Dr. Braber in that uh, I had an important conversation about our instructional assistants that, um, as I understood it, uh, typically this salary is about $25,000 a year. And that's very problematic. We talk about a livable wage, and I believe when they calculate the hourly rate, um, it, it puts it somewhere around the $14 an hour range. Um, many times our instructional assistants have a bachelor's degree. They are spouses of military families or government employees, foreign service. They're here for a time being. They can't um, necessarily uh, plan on becoming classroom teachers, uh, but we're certainly using them and incorporating them in such a way. And uh, I remember a few years ago asking the question why this, that we didn't structure our, our IA salaries to accommodate, especially those who have a bachelor's degree or higher. And our former CFO said that would make it too attractive of a position and we don't want people to be IAs, we want them to go into teaching because we have teacher shortage, et cetera. Um, unless we're telling our IAs and our teachers that the work they do 40 hours a week is only 50% of a teacher's time, then paying them $25,000 uh, uh, um, a year versus the starting teacher salary at roughly 50, basically we've said, well, that 40 hours a week was really only 50% of your workload. So I do think that the IA compensation has to be looked at. This is the year to be able to do it. Um, the other thing is that I know there was listing in here about facilities, about $3.4 million that we need to get some funding to. But I also heard almost a million of that is to our lease that we have to be paying at Willow Oaks. So in um, support of Mr. Plattenberg and our conversation on the boundaries that have not been done for years and years and years. I'm gonna make my echo request again, Dr. Braybrand, that um, I would like to see Mr. Plattenberg being encouraged to look at his operating needs and uh, that we maybe get uh, revised consideration of what needs to go into facilities because this is again a year where 
uh, we, we need to be restoring. Um, as I understand it, he inherited a department where there had been substantial cuts out of facility maintenance um, by his predecessor during the recession. And so um, that one I want on the marker. Middle school start times. Ms. Evans, I was counting on you. Um, Dr. Brabrand, this happened before your time with us, but so you don't know the promise that Dr. Garza made to this board and to our community, but we were promised that we would, in, with intentionality, look at getting middle school start times done roughly two years after we did high school start times. And in fact, we are no, we're near getting that done and we are on our fourth year now with, with later start times at high school. So put me on the list, I have another go back for tonight. Okay, um, who was last? Let me see, Ms. Hines. Um, so I just wanted to follow up a little bit on special education spending. Um, I just wanted to highlight a little bit what's, because uh, I just, I haven't done it yet. Um, so I, I'm sure I could look into this more, but just judged by what we're, what we're seeing here, I'm a little bit confused. Um, uh, I noticed on slide 11, and I'm probably just reading this wrong. It seems to say that we have fewer special education kids. Let me get back there. Where is slide 11? Um, yeah, right there. Oh, special education level two. Okay, so we've gone down in the number of level two. Okay, and that is more intense. Is that what we mean by level two? Okay, because then when we get to slide 13, it looks like we actually have an increase in 350 caseload of students with um, special education. Okay. So it looks to me then, and just tell me if, if I'm wrong, that this is a good place to look at at least one measure of what we are spending more uh, for in special ed. So uh, this budget would hire another 28.2 special education teachers, anticipated, and two special education IAs, um, and, but losing two special education technicians. So I guess I'd like a, a little more detail in, why we're losing technicians. If you, if you talked about it already, I'm sorry. Um, and then if there's any other increase in special education spending that's in the budget somewhere that we're not talking about. Go ahead. So to address your first question about the special education technicians, uh, we've been seeing a decline, and I think this is probably a nationwide thing just with technology advancements, a decline in the number of students with deaf or hard of hearing services, particularly with the severity of their deaf or hard of hearing services. And so the technicians directly relate to that. Um, so that's sort of a, a subset of the overall population. The overall population of special education students, students with an IEP, is increasing about 350. We are seeing a slight decrease in our most impacted students, which are the level two, but that's being offset by you know, more than, you know, qu quite, a, quite a few more. So the 350 versus minus 44, I think it is. So um, I think that covers that. I, I believe you might have had one other question. Well, just um, so the increase then in spending for special ed, as we're looking at it in this presentation anyway, is all about adding positions for the growth in the number of cases. Is that, that is right? That's correct. Okay. There's no other place where we're um, enhancing programming or anything. No. No. I mean, basically, it, you know, the, the, the 350 is a net. So that level one students are going up 430, the others are the level two are going down 82. So 350 is the net, and that's what that's funding. All right, I have a first time by Ms. Keys Gamara. Thank you. Um, I, I just want to get a clarification and, and then uh, register my concern. I think a few colleagues have mentioned the, scale, the list on page 9 about the impact to schools. I'm concerned about those that are... Um, these will have less staffing, I believe, is what was explained. Um, so, so what we've done is that we, when you adjust the staffing formulas, these were the five schools uh, who lost staffing based on the readjustment to the formula. Uh, it may have been due to a variety of factors. So Could if have been I on may, the cusp. this is my first three minutes. Okay. So I would like to use it. Thank you. But hold that thought. Okay. Um, so I, I want to come back to that, and I want to look at this in the context of Title I schools in particular, um, and I believe some of those schools are Title I schools, and so I, I, I'm sorry, all of them, okay. So 
I, I want you to explain that, but I want to get to also the second question. Ms. Hines reminded me of that. Um, and I, I, I'm, I guess I'm asking a clarifying question. It's the gentleman here with the glasses. Ma Matthew has a last name, I'm assuming. Ms. Norton, Mr. Norton. Okay, explain that um, the, uh, there was actually less staffing for the students with higher needs, some of the students that had higher needs. Is that what you, is that? Okay. Yeah, so we're, 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 I guess the other way you could look at the special ed is we, we're seeing a slight shift in students. We're, we see more special education students, but as a percentage, just very so slightly more of them have level one services than level two. Okay, so those students, so we're just, that is purely based on the fact that there are fewer students with the highest needs. Fewer students with, yeah, service hours. So we're hours. maintaining the same ratio in terms of staffing. As, as far as special ed staffing goes, those formulas are not changing at all. Okay, that's what I wanted to clarify. And I should have plenty of time, so Mr. Um, you have a whole minute. There you go. Go ahead. So just... a, a, a byproduct of a 50-year-old brain is that you sort of forget the first question. And so <laughs> if you wouldn't mind... Try 50 with a headache. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh, it had to do with page 9, the impact of schools being Title oh, I oh, schools. Oh, yes. So the, the impact of schools being Title I schools. So uh, when we changed the formula, we saw that they, these five schools... Uh, lost positions based on the formula change. And it also could have been due to other factors. What we noted, though, is that by changing the formulas, we saw that schools lost uh, these, these positions. And so to hold them harmless, we're giving them those positions back through the staffing reserve because we weren't, weren't really sure what those reasons were. Um, we wouldn't want to have changed the formula, gone to a school and said, oh, but you lost. When we think about the, the fact that this formula provides more staffing for all of our schools. Uh, so when you look at each of the schools that we have, our elementary schools are all receiving more staffing. Their class sizes have all decreased except for these five schools. So we wanted to hold them harmless by giving them the positions that they would have lost uh, so that they wouldn't feel the impact of this staffing change for the coming year. But have we looked at why these schools would have been impacted? Is it is it a, but just let me finish because I'm pretty sure that's going to start singing over there. Um, is, is it because the student population went down? But then I, I'm not exactly sure why. My concern is why would some of our neediest schools be kicked out of the new formula? It's really based on, on, on how students come to us. And so when we've shared with the board in the past, when we look at uh, class sizes, and when you look to see how those students come to us, uh, they may generate an additional teacher or an additional position based on those students being, or those schools being on the cusp. And so when you look at it, some of these schools may have been on the cusp, and so when enrollment has changed, when we see decreases in enrollment across the board, these changes could have been due to enrollment changes, but because they did lose, we didn't want them to lose as part of this process. And, and I guess what I'm trying to focus on is, does this pattern suggest to us that we need to look at the impact of that? And I... Go ahead, go ahead, uh... Matthew. So um, I just want to try to address this because it, I, I think it is important. Um, one of the things that I would say is if you look at these five schools, so I'm just going to take one of them, for example, that I have right in front of me. So Hutchison Elementary School was negatively impacted by the new formula. It's a reduction of one teacher position. They're a school that is projected for 1,023 students next year, and they would get under the old staffing formula 52 classroom teachers. Our new formula provides them with 51 classroom teachers. That takes them from an average class size under the old formula of 19.7 to a new average class size of 20.1. So in all four of these cases, or sorry, all five of these cases, all these schools are seeing a fairly negligible impact in their overall class size ratio. Um, I think the real reason that a lot of them are ending up the way they are is because they were schools that were right on the cusp in the FY19 formula and you know, a couple of kids up or down or a slight change in their percentage FRM was just enough to put them 
on the opposite side of the rounding of the formula. And so, you know, I, I don't want anyone to get caught up thinking that there is a huge, huge impact to these five schools. Certainly, I don't want to minimize losing a teacher, but, you know, we are holding them harmless in the first year. And I also would go so far as to say that their average class size in all five of these cases will still be quite low. And, and the other piece to understand is that this is a process that we would normally go through every year as part of our regular staffing season when we were applying those positions after the fact. And so you would see schools that would normally lose those positions uh, based on those fluctuations from one year to the next. This may have been a case where those schools would have lost those positions based on those fluctuations from one year to the next, but because we were doing a new staffing model, we didn't want anyone to feel like those fluctuations were caused by the staffing model. So as we have used in an abundance of caution, we want to give those schools the staffing that they would have gotten uh, and then move forward in subsequent years. And Marty, am I correct that the meetings and the review of staffing and the student um, enrollment counts at the, each school during the summer months prior to the opening of school will still occur on a weekly basis so that we can make adjustments if needed. So we won't have the volume because we've, we've provided a lot of those positions up front now so that we won't have to have the volume of meetings, but we will be addressing those schools where we see enrollment fluctuations and addressing those. Uh, it, we haven't figured out the, the process yet, but we wouldn't have the volume that we've had in past. But the regions will work with the principals if there's a concern. Certainly, we, and this is why we've asked for an additional uh, uh, $4.3 million for positions for the staffing reserve to mitigate any issues that might be caused by uh, the way that we've looked at projections this year or any enrollment fluctuations that we might see. All right, um, I, I haven't spoken yet, so before I do my last two go backs, um, I, I do have a question. If you could please indicate which schools are um, on the chart I don't know what page it is, um, but uh, the, the ELL student uh, uh, staffing, um, we're losing 28 teachers in various schools. If you could give us a breakdown of that. Um, Thirteen. ELL teachers losing full time, 28.5. Yeah, we, we can get that for you. Okay. We'll have to get back. Okay, and um, I do, um, my colleagues, I am thinking about um, where we're going to be using that $6 million. I will be advocating somewhat, um, I think, for the advanced academic resource teachers. I know um, I had put a question in, Ms. Hines put kind of modified my question and asked basically just for Title I. Just, just so we have an idea, when can we expect some of these answers to start coming? I know you've been very busy, but just so I kind of have a an indication because, you know, looking at our calendar, you know, we have the public hearing and we really need them before the 31st. So we are working on those questions. I just had a few questions routed up to my office for a review and signature today and we'll okay. be providing those back. So uh, it's, you know, we're, and that one is uh, <laughs> in our list of questions that we're addressing. So we're working as quickly as we can to address those questions, understanding that uh, you need them uh, for upcoming meetings. Yes. All right. Thank you. Two more go backs. Um, Ms. Evans and Ms. Corbett Sanders. Uh, just very quickly, I think. Uh, You're it's number three. These are still number two. So um, I, I do think we have to have more of uh, a greater conversation about the formula and the impact that it's had. Um, and, but my, my question for now is, is um, what was the rationale behind deciding to start needs-based staffing at 20% poverty rather than 25% poverty? And what was the rationale be, behind um, not providing a, a differential beyond 60%, uh, between 60 and 70 and 70 and 80? So I'll start with the uh, rationale for the 20%. Um, if you uh, re recall, and I think it was back under Dr. Dale, um, when we first instituted needs-based staffing, we started at 20%, and that was because research at the time suggested that was when the impact of the free and reduced lunch population started to have an effect on schools. Um, when we went to 25%, that was actually a budget reduction, uh, taking us from 20 to 25%. 
And so as part of this rework of the staffing formulas, we felt it was prudent to return to that 20% threshold as the starting point. Um, as far as the uh, capping things off at 50, 60, or 70% when you look at the different size schools, um, the cap was actually at 40% before, so we feel like by changing things, we've actually made improvements there. Um, so if you look on the left side of the screen, you can see that the factor for students you know, is 30, 40, or 50%, or 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, and that 0.5 remains the same for all schools above 40%. So we, we've sort of um, extended that to be all the way up to and 50, And I'm thinking 60, that may 70%. be because uh, we had the tipping point study that said 20% and 40%, and I'm not sure that we fully calculated that when you get to 60 and 80 that that may well be um, a, another differential. So I do see that you made improvements there. Uh, at the same time, I think we need to have a conversation as to whether we need to extend that. So I'll, I'll try to craft a question around that. Thank you. All right, um, Ms. Corbett Sanders. I would love to have a chart which will show uh, the new staff, the schools down the left hand side, across the top, staffing, new staffing formula, Title I, and ELL, and showing which schools are impacted by the decrease of 28.5 of the ELL, which ones are impacted by the Title I decrease of 21, and which schools are impacted by the new staffing formula losing staff. And that will allow us to see in one place exactly where those are. The second thing is that we've got a lot of conversation about living wage, and I think it's really important to have that conversation. However, I would like to hear from you all because it's my understanding that the living wage calculation um, is based on an absence of benefits. And if it is, then we need to know that. If it is not, then we need to know that as well. Um, so that if you could clarify exactly what goes into the living wage, I think that will help us in making those decisions about what to do. The third thing is I um, would also like to understand w the IA piece um, because of the um, significant delta between what an IA makes full time, which is um, here in uh, Northern Virginia between 21,000, actually 19,850 and 25,000. That's the market. But when you calculate the 2,080 hours, um, that go into it, I'm not sure that that computes with our discussion on the living wage as well. So uh, following up on the conversation that Ms. McLaughlin brought up, I think that would be helpful to better understand. And that's it. Thank you. All right. You, you don't have it. There was nothing here that could answer right now. No. Okay. Ms. McLaughlin, you're the last word, last go back. Um, so I had left off mentioning the middle school start times, and I know it's not something that we're going to be able to necessarily address in the FY20 budget, but I'm bringing it up because this board, this is our last year, and either we at least try to start um, down that commitment we made to the community about healthy start times for our middle school kids. And so I would really appreciate for my colleagues reflecting on that and the July or the January 31st budget work session. I think it's important that if you all agree that this was a commitment we made to the community and we want to dedicate the system to finding a solution, then we need to start having Dr. Graybrand understand where the board is on this. So um, I'll just reiterate that Nothing is more important than making sure that our students are healthy and ready to learn. The brain research is there. If you go to any of our secondary schools, Hayfield, Lake Braddock, Robinson, those middle school kids get the benefit of a healthy start time. But all the other kids who go to a middle school do not. And we have to stop doing this to kids. So I really hope we'll consider that. Um, the other thing is that um, our school nurses, you guys keep hearing me talking about it, but I, I really, um, Dr. Brabrand, I'm, I'm going to keep hammering at this. We have one school nurse per 3,000 students. I don't want to be one or a few board members who keep 
bringing this up over and over again. So my colleagues, if you understand again equity and the opportunity for students to be healthy in order to learn and to achieve everything that the National Association of School Nurses talks about is that you need to be having one school nurse per 750 students and even smaller ratios if you've got kids with health needs. With 25% of our students in Fairfax County Schools having a known health condition, we cannot continue to just say, oh well. And in talking to Michael Malloy, it's my understanding that yes, we get funding from the Board of Supervisors, but it is our school division that works with the Public Health Department on how we use that funding and how we utilize it for school nurses where we only have 63 and then we use clinic aids. So I would ask my colleagues to think about, again, bring your voice on January 31st on whether or not you think that we need to recognize that what it really means to be a school system committed to equity and school nurses is a piece of it. Um, in terms of the bachelor lane restoration, I haven't heard as much celebration, but Dr. Brabrand, I'm really appreciative of what you did. But my colleagues, please study that chart because it's not pulled up here, but if you look at the differential in pay um, on that chart for bachelor's 15 to bachelor 30 to master's degree, I don't understand when you look at it in the last four years, a bachelor's 30 to a master's, the differential goes from $15,000 a year to down to $3,000 in the final year. So basically we're telling people with a master's degree that now you're only earning $3,000 more than a bachelor's 30. So I will put in a budget question because I don't understand the breakouts there. It doesn't seem to follow market. And All yes, right. Ms. Koufax, I'll, you, I'll stop. Thank you. Um, I see, oh, Mr. Wilson, you did have a go back. I wasn't sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you for thinking of me. Um, I, I just Always. wanna echo um, uh, Ms. McLaughlin's um, couple of her comments I I too think we need to seriously consider the earlier the the, the middle school start times uh, I think that uh, that that's been a consistent comment from parents uh, who have middle school kids uh, they, they and, and and kids uh, you know the right letters to you saying please please help me with this I can't I can't stay awake in the morning so I think we do need to talk about that and consider that as a board and find out what we can do and I also just wanted to just say that I'm struggling a little bit too with the uh, the new scales uh, that's added back in on, I guess that's slide 23. Um, I see that in, for example, the BA plus 30 lane um, in the last five years, the four additional steps after 19, there's a $15,000 increase in pay. And to achieve that much of an increase earlier in the lane, it's almost 12 years. And that is sort of consistent in the BA and BA plus 15. Um, I just, I, there's two points here. One is what sort of incentives are we creating for teachers and what are we, what are we, what are we messaging to teachers uh, by, by weighting the back end of the scale like that as opposed to you know, maybe more balanced, uh, which would be more consistent with the other lanes. And then second, what's the impact on the pensions um, you know, with these changes, I think we need to understand that. Yeah, um, I did want to address the the BA lanes because, um, you know, like I said, we wanted to remain as pure as we could to the original um, proposed final schedule that appears in the the fiscal twenty budget book. Um, but the the challenge was that. All of the um, the MA, MA30, and PhD were already compressing up to step 23, but the BA30, since we were eliminating that, still went down to 29. So what you're seeing there on BA30 is the compression of 29 steps into 23, and we basically just loaded it at the bottom, spread it out across the bottom, so that the endpoints for BA, BA plus 15, and BA 30 were the original endpoints back in fiscal 17 um, that people believe they were promised. Thank you. 
And thank you, my colleagues, for um, and all of you staff for being here tonight. Uh, we're finishing 20 minutes before our expected goal. I appreciate that. Uh, yes, yeah. And um, no, we were supposed to end at eight. So that was the hard stop at eight. So, so. Um, <laughs> and Ms. Koufax, I mean, I do want to say something about that. I we did have a hard stop at eight o'clock. And I will just tell my colleagues what disappoints me is there was no dialogue. All we did was as fast as we could shoot out what we're thinking about and maybe staff could answer. A lot of times staff didn't answer and the McLaughlin, things that I asked. And I, so I'm just saying to you guys, it, it's what what is it we're trying to accomplish? So yay, we sped through a budget work session. And instead, I think you know we're walking away 20 minutes where I certainly would have valued hearing from you guys and on not just things I proposed, but what each other proposed. And I think it's a lost 20 minutes. Ms. McLaughlin, I will say again, I was not in favor of what the governance committee said before, I, I, but I'm following the rules that we all agreed to and um, nobody else has anything else to say and here's where we are. And, and I don't, this, I don't no, think it's that no, nobody has McLaughlin, anything more to we say. We're not going to argue about this. We're so not, we're not arguing the about it. Adjourned. It's just, it's not about that we don't have anything more to say. It was just people didn't have any more questions.